Ladies and gentlemen, it is my real privilege uh, to welcome to the panel our keynote speaker of today. Professor uh, Luigi Zoya uh, is an Italian psychologist, and psychoanalyst, and a writer. Uh, he has a very, I would say, uh, rich uh, curriculum, uh, having studied economics and then uh, did research on sociology. Uh, the main uh, reason why we asked him to be here today with us is because of uh, his latest publication that comes after a long process and long work of uh, more than 10 years. Uh, and it's this uh, very big and tough book uh, called Paranoia. Uh, when I first read uh, his book uh, earlier this year, I got the feeling that uh, Professor Zoya was able to some extent to create a legacy between the work of Raphael Lemkin and the history of genocide and not just the word genocide but the whole aspect of uh, humankind related to mass atrocity. And this comes out of uh, the discover, or actually the explanation, why behind the word genocide we have the madness of paranoia. The capacity to argue and dehumanize the other because of fear is the basic principle why we acknowledge the fact that why Raphael Lemkin acknowledged the fact that uh, genocide was actually, first of all, a human crime, an international crime afterwards, and uh, led him to uh, be a stubborn uh, visionary, I would say, uh, that had also the capacity of combine his theoretical research with the diplomacy aspect uh, uh, in his venture and uh, this is very important because he actually arrived to the concept of, uh, of genocide through his book Access in Occupied Europe. Uh, I was just reading uh, again today the, uh, the introduction to his book by, by William Shabash, another very important uh, international expert uh, in genocide studies uh, from Ireland. And uh, uh, he actually mentions that uh, he, uh, Raphael Lemkin was very good at uh, crafting words, but not very good at finding uh, names for books. In fact, uh, axes in occupied Europe and genocide are not really linking to some extent. Uh, and, uh, and Shabas mentioned on the fact that uh, if you put on Google uh, Axis in Occupied Europe, uh, the word genocide will come just at the hundred uh, name of, of, the, of the research. Uh, this is the part uh, that we like the most. So uh, the point is that in order to be able to address prevention and in order to be able to address genocide, we actually need to acknowledge what is behind it. And not just the madness of people uh, by saying that it's a madness, by saying that uh, who commits genocide is crazy, but actually recognizing that there is a real uh, uh, mental problem behind that, that is uh, becoming a sociological and uh, well, without further ado, I think that uh, Professor Zoya today uh, will reflect upon those uh, factors and uh, I think will give us and, uh, an incredible capacity to enter in another world that is uh, sometimes quite distant from the 
UN buildings, that is, psychology of human beings. Thank you very much for this. Sorry. Thank you. Actually, the translation would be voice is more general, right? And uh, it's interesting because in psychiatry, delusions are mostly acoustical. So let's not, but uh, there are a lot of uh, correlates to this. The voices, which are uh, a very interesting constant element in uh, um, whatever uh, historical research we do on. Uh, paranoia which affected uh, uh, society and groups, not only individuals. Um, <clears throat> so, um, my personal, if I may again uh, introduce myself, my personal uh, interest is uh, psychopathology, uh, not only individual, but when it turns collective. Um, personally, uh, I am rather unsatisfied uh, by the general status of uh, psychoanalysis uh, in very general terms, Freudian, Jungian, whatever, and uh, psychiatry nowadays. Uh, I, uh, for uh, my graphical reasons, belong to a generation which had already experience of the so-called 70s, where there was a lot of uh, naive expectation, often naive expectation that uh, psychoanalysis would uh, help to shape uh, a new, better uh, human being in, in very even general and therefore naive terms. But nowadays, um, somehow the research is extremely individualistic. And that's also quite unsatisfying. And I think, uh, well, we missed something which uh, uh, would be extremely to the point in uh, uh, today's uh, uh, topics. <coughs> um, of course, a psychoanalytic or psychiatric approach to history would be in itself what we call in uh, psychoanalysis reductive or reductionist. Uh, sorry for again my English, okay? It's just one way of looking at it. Of course, you have to combine with other uh, knowledge, right? Uh, 
uh, of course, for instance, uh, history, uh, economics, uh, etc. But if you look at the uh, um, well-known um, inflation of the Weimar Republic of the 20s, you have uh, uh, possibly to combine the element of inflation of the social unrest, unemployment, and uh, uh, tragic devaluation with the paranoid message uh, taking hold of Germany scapegoating uh, uh, a certain group as, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, that is the Jews who had killed the nation like, uh, and of course as a Jungian I pay attention to myths and that was the myth of Siegfried, which is the best known myth in German mythology and Siegfried had what? Uh, Dolstos, uh, again, they not been stabbed in the back. So <laughs> there are a lot of, I, I, I want to take my time for this, but of course a lot of interesting details uh, 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 connecting the uh, different elements to mythology, anthropology, and, and history with a certain uh, uh, perspective which is uh, more uh, psychoanalytic or psychiatric. <clears throat> Uh, for instance, if you look at uh, um, classical textbooks of psychiatry uh, nowadays, um, they, all the best books, they speak of uh, uh, psychiatric syndromes always in an individualistic sense and uh, um, say uh, psychosis or mental disturbances are nowadays only individual. Actually, the only textbook, not by chance, which makes a mention to collective psychosis is Jaspers, because of course, as you know, Jaspers was, of course, started as a psychiatrist, but then became one of the foremost uh, philosophers, I mean, <laughs> and a broader. But he says that uh, mass psychosis are something from the past, right? Um, Collective possession is something from the past. Okay, collective possession, for instance, the children crusade, which was a possession, really, in, in the psychiatric sense. Um, so, the textbooks suffer, again, to, of course, oversimplify a, a, a complex topic, but uh, studying the history of, of psychiatry, uh, and the history of historical textbooks of psychiatry is suffered of Western individualism, somehow, you know, concentrates only in the individual. And uh, um, if we, uh, I, I, I assume I speak to a quite qualified audience, if we just uh, bear in mind what is a lynching or a pogrom, uh, we immediately see that a sort of mass psychotic or at least uh, uh, disturbance, uh, you know, of, uh, of the mental functioning, uh, taking the, the group, the mass, is still possible nowadays. And actually it's what we are speaking of nowadays, right? Uh, and not only, I mean, if you take for instance, unfortunately often it is necessary to understand how things come about, even horrible textbooks like the Journal of Goebbels. And he, in, uh, uh, what was it, I think February 43, uh, after his famous speech on total war, no? where he speaks on the radio and to a mass audience about in the total entry, and everybody answers yes, uh, he, registers the entry in his, uh, how do you say, diary, the same day is this is Stunde der Idiotie. He analyzes that and says, this is idiotic, okay? This is a mental infection, because all uh, uh, textbooks somehow, even before Freud, you know, the bone from whom Freud takes, uh, speaks, I think we all know of the fact that the mass tends to lower the uh, mental functioning to the lowest level of, of the, you know, worst individual in, in the mass. Okay, so even Goebbels understands that, of course, he is not consistent with, uh, with this. 
And so, um, why paranoia? Why study paranoia? It's uh, quite, um, I think, uh, evident even to the non-specialist audience because uh, if we take, we know that mental disorders are um, historically and sociologically conditioned. We all know, even if you are not expert, that psychoanalysis was born as a study of hysteria. We all know that the hysteria all hardly exists uh, anymore, but uh, luckily psychoanalysis uh, <laughs> still exists. Uh, we know that there are new disturbances like eating disorders, which are typical of uh, nowadays, of the end of 20th century, beginning of the 21st. But uh, they, they are devastating, they can be devastating, of course, particularly in the West, you know, bulimia, anorexia, this uh, having too much food and uh, having lost through consumerism the connection to our appetite. But this is tragic, but remains individual. Okay, you have an individual anorexic girl in your family, it destroys her life and the life of the family, but it's not contagious. Paranoia and a paranoid message can be highly psychologically infectious, okay? Um, so paranoia has a collective correlate, if, I, if that makes sense in English, unlike the other mental illnesses, and actually uh, is the most serious, uh, um, it, it, to put it in uh, Jungian terms, it infects the collective unconscious, not just the individual unconscious. <clears throat> uh, to uh, spend a word on the concept itself, because paranoia has unfortunately become almost a, a commercial term. You know, in reality, I mean, you have Woody Allen's in movies saying, oh, of course, uh, even paranoid people have enemies, okay? Which is true, absolutely, you know, you need that common sense. Uh, but it has entered the, the common language. Um, but paranoia, actually, um, what we understand is more or less correct. I mean, the traditional concept, which goes back to the ancient Greek, para, which means uh, deviated, or a little bit, and nous, mind, you know, a bit aside, functioning aside, or functioning uh, beyond the, the normal, uh, is still valid. <coughs> Uh, and um, more specifically, the term has come through the centuries to mean um, the specific affection of a, a mind which suffers from persecution complexes, from a constant persuasion of facing enemies. And the mind gets focalized on that, and that gets, um, becomes the priority of everything. Of course, there are numerous traits which I've tried to collect once again. I mean, I tried to, to, to put together in a, as much as possible consistent uh, way uh, in my work, uh, psychiatric knowledge, which was already there, psychoanalytic knowledge, historical knowledge, etc. But uh, mm, to summarize, um, the, it is common, uh, commonly accepted that there is an, a weak mind, a weak individual in the origin, and pretty lonely. And the extreme loneliness, isolation, and mechanical functioning, mm, without feel, feeling less functioning of the mind, <coughs> Uh, tends to get overcompensated through, uh, as one says in psychoanalysis, or at least in Jungian terms, whatever is natural, necessary, that is human relationship, and is not experienced, will one day or another pop up anyhow in a uh, perverted form, you know, because the unconscious pushes, uh, you know, to re so, the, the lack of uh, connection pops up in the perverted form. I, have, I don't have friends, but I have enemies, you know? And I have feelings in that I don't love, but at least I hate, you know? And 
here one should open. Uh, it's something I'm trying to do in other studies, a, a big chapter about our new centuries, whether our new century isn't the century of a lack of uh, feeling and the evil isn't becoming <laughs> somehow, you know, anyhow. Uh, that's very typical, of course, of 20th century and of uh, mass hate. <clears throat> so, um, again, to put the extreme case of the extreme totally paranoid individual, of course, we are all somehow single individual on the line connected uh, somehow an ideal normality and an extreme paranoia, we are humans, but extreme paranoia uh, represent the polarity of no insight, no capacity of really looking inside, to put it in a very simplified form, and no inner uh, dimension, no psychology somehow, no vertical gaze, and only an horizontal gaze to discover who are the potential elements around me. <clears throat> and to this, the consequence of this is an extreme form of what we in uh, psychoanalysis of old school would call splitting and projection. So whatever is evil, whatever is negative, is not perceived as something which I as an imperfect, uh, as a uh, normal human being, uh, <laughs> hide in myself, but it's only perceived outside, projected in uh, um, uh, an enemy, an adversary, or to put it in a, a terminology which you all will understand, uh, which comes more from anthropology, in scapegoating, finding a scapegoat, you know, which has also ritualistic, comes from primitive tribal modality of uh, very collective, small community life, uh, getting rid of evil, I mean, a mechanism which, after all, has been functioning for time immemorial, but uh, uh, becomes, of course, devastating in uh, a present uh, uh, man society. So, uh, to uh, summarize again with the term, um, paranoia was denominated for the first time by French psychiatry already in the um, 19th century as la folie lucide, you know, I think in English lucid folly, uh, so intelligent folly. And here we come little by little to, to our point, you know, because there is uh, like Hamlet, you know, intelligence also very often in, in the panel. So it proceeds to, again, to put the basic terms, uh, in the paranoid mind, usually in the extreme paranoid mind, there is a first moment which has been a moment of illumination, an intuition of a truth, which usually has to do with the, the scapegoating and perceiving the enemy. <clears throat> and this um, is very uh, um, similar to uh, what in religion is revelation, you know, taking the veil of, uh, you know, see finally something, some truth. And uh, from this proceeds the rest, the lucid passages, the apparently logical, consequent passages. For instance, if one has still the patience or the stomach of doing it, it's very inter interesting, uh, also somehow clever, um, what uh, uh, Adolf Hitler does, I think, in the 11th chapter of the Mein Kampf, uh, where he sees how his anti uh, describes how his anti-Semitism started, with an illumination. It's a gradual proceeding till a specific moment of illumination. And after this, all the rest comes as a consequence. He says, I fix my granit le fundament, no? granitic, a stone foundation for all his thinking. And the rest, uh, at that point, becomes, of course, again, in the extreme paranoid mind like his, uh, the logical uh, consequent passages, uh, uh, which, uh, of course, in uh, 
uh, psychoanalysis or psychiatry would be rather paralogical, you know, kind of like paranoia or field of logical uh, passages. <coughs> um, so uh, we have summed up most of these characteristics, starting from a general suspiciousness which, I was recalling Woody Allen, after all, is a normal feature of our human mind. If we do not suspect, we cannot live, particularly in the complexity of nowadays society. We have, we cannot trust everybody in every situation. We must first know. So if we start from a universal potential. Once again, here is, uh, say, my Jungian matrix of, uh, of uh, training, you know, Jung speaks of archetypes. I see it as an archetype, as a universal potential, which then degenerates uh, in extreme form in, in many individuals to the point of having uh, specific ideas of, for instance, common trade is the idea of conspiracy. All over uh, you see a conspiracy, you feel yourself uh, surrounded all the time, whose consequence is that having enemies, you, uh, it will be necessary to attack first, because if there are enemies, they will attack you one day. So a total mental persuasion with uh, no proof, usually, or just a paralogical proof, but which has tragic consequences. Total disproportion, a total rigidity of this mental uh, proceeding, and, and so on. Uh, until it makes, um, I mean, another uh, extremely interesting feature, which in my research I underline because it's uh, what interests us in the uh, bright, ma bright <laughs> quotes, mind, uh, uh, the successful paranoid mind, you know, is a sort of absolute consistency, um, namely the causes of, of uh, the process can be inverted just to form a tautology, that is to always confirm, you know, even that which should disconfirm uh, ends up confirming what you are uh, believing on to uh, speak of a tragic reality concerning uh, Poland. For instance, in October 39, uh, again, two names we have mentioned, Hitler and Goebbels, get a lot of reports from uh, uh, invaded Poland, and particularly, of course, from the ghettos, which are again, you know, uh, formed and, uh, um, uh, and, and, and put under uh, military control uh, and where the Jews start living in uh, tragic uh, conditions. Of course, we are far from Vance, but we are already in the beginning of the war. And all the data uh, showing that uh, there is a lot of, uh, um, uh, in, how do you say, um, infections, you know, medical infections, thriving and things like this which should be a confirmation of the terrible handling of the situation by the occupying Jew, is taken as a confirmation of the fact that the Jews are dirty, you know, that they do not care about hygiene. So they, it, everything gets inverted. And to uh, mention another, I mean, uh, uh, um, a topic which you will find in uh, um, minutes of uh, um, uh, Hitler um, talks uh, concerning this time uh, Slavic populations and not Jews, you know, or we all know of the anti Slavic radical prejudice. So, and in one talk during the war, Second World War, uh, Hitler uh, is speaking of the Slavic uh, um, general incapacity of working, you know, uh, the Slavic people are not trustful workers, and somebody dares to object that uh, um, 
Of course, yes, but look at the Czechs, you know, where they were speaking also of the remains of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, of which you know what is nowadays the Czech Republic and was had been Bohemia, etc., etc., was the most uh, efficient industrialized part of the former empire, you know, with mechanical factories which still exist now, and very reliable uh, workforce. Mm -hmm. And Hitler has the immediate counter objection. Yes, the Czechs are a specific type of Slavic people. Not only we shouldn't trust them because they are Slavic and so not trustworthy, they cheat, but they cheat us to the extent that they pretend to be half Germans, you know, so they were well integrated actually in the ocean. So they pretend to be good workers. So you must mistrust the Czech twice, you know. So every topic gets. Um, uh, in, inverted, you know, and uh, um, of course, just to make a very small hint, and I take 10 more minutes, okay, uh, uh, um, uh, touching upon Stalin, who is a paranoid person of another kind, but highly, uh, actually, even more, more efficient somehow, um, uh, you will find in the history textbooks uh, that uh, in the census <coughs> of the 37 of the Soviet Union, uh, <coughs> he, um, unlike the usual paranoid, who is usually very careful because he fears enemies, and there he feared, feared enemies even in his inner circle. That's the difference somehow in the Soviet Union, you know. But uh, um, he anticipates somehow, uh, is quite proud. There is, of course, this omnipotent feeling very often in successful paranoid people. Um, um, and uh, uh, lets himself go a little bit, anticipating that uh, by the census and by the end of that quinquennial uh, plan, <clears throat> Soviet Union will have not just that and that uh, uh, total production output, but also uh, about 180 million inhabitants. That were the projection, because of course you have to combine the two elements. And uh, uh, the official uh, commission of the professor of statistics of the University of the Soviet Union are gathering the data and there is an enormous amount of people missing in the data of the population. We shall not enter why. <laughs> we all have intuition, right? There have been a lot of, uh, yeah, the great terror or things like this, and uh, so many of these were not registered. So what's Stalin's solution in front of this lack of uh, uh, population, of uh, the inconsistent data with what he had been uh, um, anticipating. Uh, the solution is that the Commission of Statisticians has been conspiring against the Quinquennial Plan. So the solution, after all, was simple. You had to put it to the wall and kill the statisticians and remake. So somehow, you know, the, <laughs> what was uh, an objective reality, uh, somehow, which could have been critical of his handling, turns into another proof that there is a conspiracy and he has to further eliminate uh, enemies. Uh, <clears throat> and so with this, uh, we have come to the point, which is uh, uh, my point in, in this uh, research, that uh, unlike um, other mental illnesses, in paranoia you have a collective element, but also uh, quite a few successful paranoia. Okay, and uh, um, the control of mass media through the oversimplification of the message gives somehow an advantage to them. So the, um, now I, I anticipating the conclusion uh, in a way is that uh, um, mass media, of course, on the one side are of a greatest advantage, yes, and uh, um, they help us to have to spread information, but at the same time the control of mass media can help 
The, and the bad quality mass media can help the oversimplification of the message, and the most typical oversimplification of the message is to find a scapegoat, you know, to find an enemy, etc. So you can have somehow a paranoia, which is, uh, I would distinguish, in the nowadays um, democratic society, uh, could be a soft paranoia. The bad quality mass media still use oversimplified uh, argument populism, uh, for instance, in my country now against immigrants in general, and of course in those times, in uh, fascist times, uh, against uh, minorities uh, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, which means again that, that we have a collective infection which is easy to spread and to put it in the words of a person I admire very much, Primo Levi, who I grew up, <laughs> you will all know. The monsters uh, exist, but are few, to refer to the paranoid leader, but what is really dangerous is the normal uh, human, you know, who gets infected. So the, uh, to go back to an Arendt concept of the banality of evil and also to an idea I've tried to develop in this the lack of symmetry between good and evil. Sometimes uh, it is enough one individual which want to start something aggressive, evil. For instance, uh, uh, if you start how World War I has started, you know, if you study with suspicions and paranoia. Uh, in, the, in the diplomatic services, gradually taking over until what I've called the panda's arrow uh, effect. Panda is, uh, if you remember, in the Iliad, <laughs> mythical figure, which just with one arrow can restart the war of Troy. You know, there is this asymmetry. Uh, oh, uh, the, the balance tilts, and for quite a while you will have just uh, uh, paranoia widespread as a... Okay, I think I have to thank you very much and uh, uh, I, I didn't take your time to go into the possibility of studying, say, things of prevention and anyhow, I, I hate analysts, psychoanalysts who become gurus and make proposals, but I mean to study, you know, uh, these elements to study what has been called the pseudo-speciation, that is the splitting a projection into another group as if it were belonging to another species. This is typical, for instance, if you restudy the Mein Kampf, or certain elements of propaganda in which you see the gradual animalization of another group of humans. You see it in cartoons and so on, and this is a very... So just to study these uh, retrospectively uh, warning signals which uh, would uh, help us to understand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Zoya. I think that uh, truly this was uh, an exceptional I would say, and, and uh, very, uh, I would say, intense discourse on, on, on history of, 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 even of the problem that we are here uh, mentioning, that is genocide. And it's exact uh, part of the problems that we, we take from, from what you say is, uh, is the part, is, is really the last part, the animalization. So is the dehumanization of the enemy. But at the same time, the dehumanization of the enemy puts the perpetrator in the in the in the point of being superhuman, and meaning that uh, none of them is human anymore, and uh, and and the humankind is left off in a way. And uh, this is part of, of the of the legacy uh, that brings us to to the to the real panel. Uh, of what would have Lemkin said. <laughs> what would have Lemkin said? Uh, he died and just seven people attended his funeral. I suspect that 
this factor gives us now the moment of reflection. Uh, Andrei Mital uh, from Poland before was speaking about the fact that uh, Lemkin also legacy with Poland was almost left away for ages and decades and uh, and returning to, to the promising aspect of uh, of contemporary research that uh, led partly to, to the creation of the ICC but also of the special tribunals before and this is part of, of the next lecture that we are uh, having uh, now from Professor Paula Gaeta. Uh, professor Paula Gaeta is uh, a professor at the Faculty of Law of the University of Geneva, but more is an adjunct professor at the, at the Graduate Institute of, uh, of International and Development Studies and director of the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights. And uh, the point. Uh, she, she has, uh, of course, as, as everyone here, I think, uh, a real uh, full uh, curriculum about uh, study of law and international law and humanitarian law. Uh, we, we have a legacy uh, with Professor Gaeta because she was present in the uh, very uh, first seminar uh, on the prevention of genocide that was uh, held here at the Human Rights Council uh, uh, together with Professor Deng that uh, regretfully uh, was not able to make it uh, to come to, uh, to Geneva this time. And uh, we, we thought about uh, uh, her role in that section uh, in order to uh, still go on with the reflection on, on how actually international law uh, is seen today, but with the eyes of Rafael This is the, uh, the quest that we, we have for her today, is uh, to reflect on, uh, on, on the second aspect of the, of the convention. As we say, the convention is the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. Uh, prevention was really left over, uh, and punishment had the possibility to grow just from the formation of the special tribunals onwards. I mean, the, the convention was completely forgotten for decades. And uh, it is with the special tribunals of, uh, of, um, of the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda that we gain again the, the factor of uh, international law and the use of the convention uh, to go on with that. So I would really... Uh, like her to, to have this, uh, this reflection with Lemkin eyes today, uh, what, what would have Lemkin said about how international right? law did develop thanks to the convention and, uh, and how now the convention is part uh, of our legacy towards as well the aspect of prevention. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. It's quite a challenge, I'd say. Uh, uh, it is true that when the convention was adopted and Lemkin was there, he was found crying in a corner. Uh, and I don't know if he was crying because he was so happy that the convention finally was adopted or because finally what was adopted was not exactly what he was expecting. So that's, I think, that we can have both interpretations, perhaps. Uh, because as you know, when the convention was adopted, uh, some international lawyers have very much criticized it to be a sort of useless instrument. Uh, because it was not, it, it is not a very much geared towards prevention, as you know. Uh, the only possibilities uh, is uh, for the prevention side is for the contracting parties to call upon uh, the uh, organs of the UN to take action in case of genocide, although therefore without adding much to the powers that the, the United Nations organs already possess under the UN Charter. And then the second mechanism of enforcement, uh, which was quite uh, a novelty at that time, uh, was the insertion of Article 9, which contains the compromissory clause for the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice uh, for the interpretation and application of the Convention. And as we know, this Article 9 has been used 
uh, recently by, by, by Bosnia and by, and by Croatia, but uh, its importance has been diminished because of the mechanism of reservation uh, to Article 9, uh, which were, was also approved by the International Court of Justice itself in a famous advisory opinion in 1941. So, apart from for this, my thing that uh, what I would like to discuss is this, the perspective of Lemkin uh, with regard to the definition of genocide, the repression of the crime of genocide, and perhaps I would say something about how we could uh, improve the convention by envisaging perhaps new mechanism uh, for enforcing the convention nowadays. And uh, so let me first start with the definition of genocide. Uh, we know very well that Lemkin uh, was looking for a name to describe crimes that uh, uh, Churchill in 1941 uh, uh, considered to be without a name. So apparently he searched for uh, a new name for a very well-known phenomenon in the history of mankind that started when he listened to the speech by Churchill uh, who mentioned the crimes without names committed by the Nazis uh, during, and during and before the war. So when he was looking for the name for those crimes, uh, as you mentioned, Enzo, he was uh, doing a lot of experiments. He was a linguist. He just, I think he spoke 10 languages or something like that. Uh, and uh, apparently <coughs> what he was looking for was something similar to what George Eastman, uh, the founder of the Kodak, Kodak Enterprise, uh, described to be the reason for which he had cho chosen Kodak as a name to launch the new camera for non-professionals. So Lemkin apparently was very much um, uh, interesting in find a similar name like Kodak that according to George Eastman uh, was the correct name for the camera because of its concision, simplicity and close identification with the intended object. So for him, names should describe reality. And therefore, he wanted to find the correct name for the mass killings and other atrocities committed at that time. And finally, he decided for the word genocide, and he was a bit indecisive between genocide and ethnocide. And I insist on the fact of genocide because the, uh, the, his notion of uh, the crimes was not only the physical and biological destruction of groups, but also the destruction of the institutions of a group with the so-called cultural genocide. Uh, for him, ethnocide or ethnocide could describe better the physical and biological destruction of a group, while genocide would also encompass the cultural dimension of the potential destruction of a group. That I insist very much on this because, as we will know, or we know already, the definition of genocide, which finally was uh, included in the Genocide Convention, has mainly focused on the physical and biological destruction of the protected groups, while the cultural genocide, namely the destruction of the group through the destruction of the institutions of the group itself, uh, has left uh, a little, uh, just a little uh, remnant uh, in the fifth genocidal act, uh, namely the transfer of children from a group to another. Because in this case, a genocide would be realized not by killing the children, but by destroying the possibility for the group to, to expand because the children would lose their language, their tradition, their custom, their culture by being transferred to another group. But this is the only reminiscent of the cultural genocide for which Lemkin was very much uh, attentive to.